Welcome to Common Grounds, a connect group of Sagemont Church, Houston, Texas. Thank you for joining us as we continue through Acts with Drawn Together. Hope you enjoy today's lesson. Acts 12. We recently have been looking at Cornelius and the gospel going to uh, the Gentiles with Cornelius first. And you see in Acts God doing great things. I love reading the Bible for patterns. It's, I guess it's the history person in me, but seeing the patterns of things that happen. You see God moving in power and doing incredible things and hundreds of people being saved, thousands of people being saved, and then you see persecution. And then you see God moving and saving more people and things happening. You see more persecution. So you see this back and forth in, in Acts. You see it in Paul's life. You see it in the early church in Jerusalem. And uh, here we're picking up with more persecution in Acts chapter 12. God has been working. He has been doing amazing things. And, of course, the devil doesn't like that. But God, in his sovereignty, allows the enemy to do things that we don't understand in this world. We're understanding it in the next. Well, that uh, brings us to Acts chapter 12, verse 1. It says, about that time, and that's the time of the end of Acts 11 there, when um, some prophets came to Antioch from Jerusalem, prophesied a famine, and they took up a, a collection for the coming famine that the Holy Spirit told them about. They sent it by the elders, or to the elders, by uh, the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So you see Barnabas and Saul already kind of working together, already kind of being together as friends for a while before the Holy Spirit says set them apart. So you see the Holy Spirit working in Barnabas and Paul's relationship long before he sends them out on the mission field, which is it's pretty cool to see that. Man, I've been, I've been learning so much through Acts. I'm so glad we're studying Acts right now. You know, it doesn't matter how long you read the Bible or how many years you've read it. You keep studying it. You always see new things. It's just amazing how alive this book is and how it speaks to you and how, how you learn new things every time you really dig and study into God's Word. So let me encourage you to do that in your life. Be a student of the Word of God. God will teach you new things. And uh, it's, it's pretty cool. So... In Acts chapter 12, it says, About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. All right, so here's Herod. Uh, this is, there's actually a lot of Herods in the Bible. Okay, You see that name, Herod. Um, and actually, I looked up the Greek on that. It comes from the word hero. So when his mom named the first Herod, who they called Herod the Great, it uh, means song of the hero. And it kind of relates to military uh, battle a little bit. His dad was a... Uh, uh, leader for Rome and things like that, and I uh, wanted this son to be this this hero. Uh, the only thing heroic about him is he kind of he helped build the temple and do that, but everything about the original Herod was horrible. He was a horrible, evil man. The original Herod, not this one. It's a different one. He's evil too. They're all evil, actually. Um, but uh, the original one, remember what he did? He, uh, he just thinking that um, Jesus, the Messiah, was going to be in Bethlehem, killed all the babies. Didn't even do research as to which one was the Messiah, just killed them all. That's, that's, his, that's this guy's you know, ancestor. Okay? That's who he's coming from. So this, and these guys were, they were brutal. That original Herod, he killed wives, he killed his own children. If there was a rumor that they were going to kill him and replace him with a son, he just went ahead and killed the wife and both the sons. This is the generation of people they're dealing with here. This is the family, the ruling family they're dealing with. And so there's Herod, which they called Herod the Great, who killed the babies when Jesus was born. There's Archelaus, his son, when, when um, Joseph and Mary were coming back from Egypt, they said, hey, we're, we're not, they were afraid to settle in Judea because Archelaus, the son of Herod, was ruling there. So they went up north to Galilee. So that's how the Lord ends up being raised in Nazareth. Then there was Herod Antipas, okay, who killed John the Baptist, and Herod Antipas was the one that Jesus was in trial on, and I actually studied what happened to him not long after he, you know, was part of Jesus's trial. Jesus never spoke to Herod Antipas, but he mocked Jesus, mocked God to his face. Um, not long after that, he died a very extremely painful death. In fact, he tried to commit suicide. It was, he was in such pain, and his friend saved him from many suicide. So, you know, you, you see the wrath of God, in history, you see the wrath of God in the Word of God. It's a part of who God is. Um, he is a just God. He's a holy God. We can't make up God into what we want him to be. He is who he is, and he reveals himself through his Word. But this Herod is called Herod Agrippa. Okay? So, and there's two Agrippas, actually. There's another one that Paul will be in front of, so it's like five Herods. It's not just one in the Bible. So, this is Herod Agrippa the first, 
and he's the guy who kills James, the brother of John. Now, if you've read the Bible any length of time, when you go through this verse, you just say, oh yeah, he killed James. And you don't really get the emotional impact of what's going on here. If you've lost a loved one through murder, you can understand this. But if you haven't, it's kind of hard to grasp losing a, someone you love. From, how, how did John feel, the Apostle John, losing his brother to murder? And it says here in verse 1 that Herod just didn't kill James. James was one example in verse 2. It says, he killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. He may have killed other people, too, because it said he made violent hands on those belonging to the church. So there's other people he may have had or tortured or beaten up or whatever or whipped or flogged or maybe even killed. But Luke, when he writes Acts, just mentions James as the one of the apostles who is killed uh, the brother of John with the sword. So the church is being persecuted. They're in the midst of all this growth and all this amazing stuff, they're being bold right in the same city, right in the presence of place of, of persecution where they're being killed. Who was killed before James? Do you remember? The stone. Stephen. Yeah. Well, Stephen was the first prominent one besides Jesus, who they killed too. And Stephen was stoned and killed. They just kept right on preaching, man. Kept right on preaching. Kept right on doing God's will. Church kept right on doing it. And then he kills James. Um, yeah, you, we don't understand the sovereignty of God, but like going back to Sarah's prayer, uh, which is a wonderful prayer, by the way, um, God has a sovereign will. And we don't understand that on this side of eternity. In eternity, we'll understand it. But we have to remember this world is just a temporary place. We have to remember that eternity is much better than here. So is James in a better state because Herod killed them? Absolutely. He's with Jesus. He's with his Lord. He's, he's in paradise. He's in glory. He's got more joy than anybody left here in Acts. It was his time to go, and God allowed him to be killed. But yes, the, the anguish and the suffering and what is felt by the church there in Jerusalem, not only they've lost this great leader in Stephen, now they lose James too. And for you to understand how fervently they're praying for Peter, because verse 3 says, when he saw that it pleased the Jews, this is Herod, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. They got Stephen, they killed him, now they killed James, now they got Peter, the leader, okay? So think, try to stop and think about the emotion that's going on here. And I, I hate to even use this illustration, just because it's horrific to even talk about, but let me give you this illustration to understand what the church is going through and how fervently they're praying for Peter. Imagine Stuart Rothberg getting up to preach and teach one Sunday and somebody walks in and shoots him in front of us. Okay? Imagine how devastating that would be. This is what the early church is going through, y'all. Okay? This is it's equivalent. And we're grieving and we're mourning and, and it takes a while and we're scared. And about a year later, okay, Somebody walks in and shoots our pastor. It's horrible to even talk about, right? This is what they're going through in Acts. This is exactly what they're going through. This is the emotions that they're feeling. I got Peter, too. So, Lord, you know, it's super possible that Peter could be dead, too. And they were planning on killing Peter. It was, it was in the works. In fact, he gets released the night before. An angel releases him the night before he's going to be taken out and killed. So when Herod saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And Herod is not a God pleaser, he's a people pleaser. Some of these leaders get to be leaders because they please people. All politicians today, I know where their votes are coming from. Not all of them, but you have to please God first in your life. In everything you do at work, at home, and everything you do in life at church, you have to please God first. You have to obey his word first. And if you know anything about ministry, you know anything about life, you can't please everybody, even in church, y'all. You know? You've got to please the Lord. You've got to strive to please Him and do what's pleasing in His sight. Obey His word. And then let everyone else please Him. It doesn't matter in some ways. Because okay? you're pleasing God first. So there's intense suffering going on here. But there's also incredible boldness at the same time. Incredible growth. This is not like our culture today, okay, in many ways, what we're going through. I wonder, well, as I was studying this, I wonder, I wonder what would happen. If you transported the apostles into American culture today, and you took them, how bold they were, and you put them, you put them in American society, and said, let them loose on, on the cities, let them loose on Chicago, LA, San Francisco, Houston, 
Imagine if you took these apostles who were this bold in the face of death and persecution and put them in America, in the ripe harvest fields of America. Oh, man, it'd be hard. They're not going to get thrown in jail. Probably, you know. They're not, they're not going to be persecuted. They have such freedom. To, they wouldn't believe it. The freedom they had to preach the gospel all over this nation because of our government and our laws and our rules and how we were established and our freedom of religion. They would be on fire. And with our resources, our tracts and Bibles and the Internet and ways they could preach online and everything that they could do. And I think they'd have some pretty firm words for the churches at times on things. Well, aren't you obeying Paul? Right? Why did you start knowing more, than, knowing more than he did? I think they, the, you set the apostles loose in modern-day America, it would be unbelievable. I'd love to see it. Well, God has not ordained that. God has ordained that we are here in modern-day America with these right harvest fields. And we're probably not going to be thrown in jail for sharing the gospel anywhere. So let's go. Let's get out there. You know, a lot of the stuff we get depressed and discouraged with and stuff about it has nothing to do with what really matters. It really doesn't. I mean, when I get upset about things at work and I get focused on this and focused on that, oh, church isn't perfect, work isn't perfect, but I'm not perfect. It's like, you know what really matters? I'm going to heaven one day. What about them? Am I focused on the loss? If I forget, you know what? what really matters to me is I've got to get out there and share the gospel with people. This matters more than all this other little stuff how much money I have, or how clean my house is, or whether my yard looks nice, or how work's going, or how kids are treating me, or how, how principals are treating me. None of that stuff matters in the light of eternity, right? What will help you focus is, hey, who do I need to tell about Jesus? That's what I need to be doing. I need to be praying for the lost. I need to be sharing with the lost. Yeah, that's not the only thing we're supposed to be doing. But I'll tell you, it'll clear your head. Sometimes our priorities are messed up. We let things that aren't eternal bother us when the eternal things are not really that concerned about. I, was, uh, I keep buying these plants and they keep dying this year. I don't know what's up this year. They always grow in my yard and they keep dying. I was standing there. I was like so frustrated. I was like, they're dying again. And the Holy Spirit just kind of spoke to me and said, you know, you're more concerned about them than you are your neighbors. Maybe he's killing the plants. Holy Spirit, listen. The plants are plants. These people are souls that live around me. So as I'm walking up and down my street now, I'm praying for my neighbors. And I had a great conversation yesterday with a neighbor across the street who's a Christian guy, but they're in and out of church and things like that. We just had a great conversation. People would just listen to him and minister to him. And, it, you know, listening is a huge ministry, just listening to people. And we got to talk and share. And he's actually studying biblical texts. So I told him about an interlinear. And we, he, we, just, we just had a good conversation. But I've been praying for him for a long time and my neighbors for a long time. He said his daughter's going to church. And this other church was with a friend, which is great. It's an answered prayer. Are we praying for our neighbors? People in our apartment complex, people at work, people up and on our street who don't know the Lord. Look, y'all, at the end of the day, we're going to be good. No matter how much we suffer in this life, we're going to be good for eternity. We're going to be with the Lord forever with perfect joy that never changes. We are fine. We're good. We're all right. We've got it. What about them? Are we on mission like they were in Acts? You know, when you study these apostles, you study Paul and guys like this, they need single-minded passion to do God's will. Single-minded passion to spread the gospel, to preach, to teach, to obey the word of the Lord, to do God's will on the earth. That was it. That, they didn't care about anything else. They were passionate about it. They were focused on it. You don't read too much about the apostles' wives and children, do you? They were, they, that, they loved them, I'm sure, and they took care of them. They were good husbands and things like that. But they, they were consumed with the passion to spread the gospel, to serve God. That's what we hear about them, what we read about them. So Herod has arrested Peter. Okay. Um, this was during the days of unleavened bread. So it's actually this time of year. It's during Passover. Passover is one day. And then Unleavened Bread Festival goes for seven days after that. So it's an eight-day combined festival, but they often call it just Passover Unleavened Bread. So he put him in prison. He delivered him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. Literally, the Greek says four squads of four soldiers. So 16 soldiers guard Peter. Why did they do that? Do you know what happened earlier in Acts? The apostles were thrown in jail, and an angel came, got him out, <laughs> told him to go preach, and they just went out and preached. So he's got 16. Here, Garden Peter, intending after the Passover, I think this is after the feast, so after the eight-day feast, to bring him out to the people. 
So Peter was kept in prison, but here's the key, y'all. Look at verse 5. Earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Question for you. Is there a difference between prayer and earnest prayer? I think so. I think so. You know, when you really feel something, you want something, you're desiring for it, a lot of times that's the Holy Spirit inside of you praying the will of God. Now, God, you don't have to always be just incredibly intense in your prayers because we're commanded by the Bible not to be earnest in our prayers. We're commanded to be have a prayer of faith, pray in faith. All right, so faith is much more important than just this emotional earnestness. But to me, there is something about earnest prayer. When you're really into prayer, you're really praying for someone, you're praying for their salvation, it's, it's, it's consuming your whole being. That's the Holy Spirit working in you for. That's the Holy Spirit bringing you those tears, and you're asking God for compassion to see people, to feel about people the way he feels about them. And that's what the church is doing. They lost Stephen. Okay? They lost James. So they are earnestly praying for Peter. Lord, don't take Peter to us. He's our leader. We need Peter. Um, Paul's not around yet as a leader. He's there. He's on the forefront. So, verse 6. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night... That very night, the next day, this is, you know, sometimes God answers prayer right at, the, right at the perfect time, right right at the end. I had a friend who was looking for a job all summer. He was a teacher, and he got one just like right before school started. He's like, Lord, make me wait until the very end. But that very night, God comes through. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, I love it when the Bible does that, behold. That's a good thing getting ready to come, right? Behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him. A light shone in the cell, or the light of the glory of God. He struck Peter on the side, waking him up. This is the middle of the night. Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. Boom. He was chained with his hands, not his feet, his hands. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. You ever been woken up in the middle of the night or had a dream in the middle of the night? You're like, hey, this is real. What's going on? You know, did that happen last night? Did I get up last night? Or... Middle of the night. When he passed through the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading to the city. So this prison is outside of the city of Jerusalem. Roman prison, outside of the city. So he's bringing Peter back into the city where he can... Go to, go to the disciples. They came to the iron gate. It opened for them on its own accord. Right? The iron gate. It just opens up. When God decides to do something, all our little things will make her. Worthless is going to move. Okay? You can say all you want about the devil in this country and people. Will need. When God decides to move, good luck. When God decides to move, he doesn't need anybody. Okay? He's, he's going to move. He's going to crush through every barrier. He doesn't need a white house or Supreme Court, he can do whatever he wants. When he decides to send revival to this nation, nobody can stop it. The iron gate opens up. It opens for them on its own accord, and they went out and went along one street. So they walked down the whole street, and immediately the angel left him. Boom. Gone. Okay. And it says, and when Peter came to himself, he's kind of in a day. This is the middle of the night. He thinks he's seeing a vision. He thinks he's like in a dream or something, and He's not sure what's going on. And then all of a sudden, he's following this angel along. He's still not sure, you know, what's going on. Is this real or not? And then, boom, the angel leaves. And when the angel leaves, God allows him to see, you're awake. You're, you're not sleepwalking. You're alive. And you're out of prison. And he, all of a sudden, he came to himself. He realized what had just happened. It was real. He's out. Now, you, you got to understand what Peter's going through, too, because... He saw Stephen killed. He saw the Lord killed. He saw Stephen killed. He saw, he saw James killed. And what had Jesus told Peter about his future? Do you remember that? When he saw John and John said, oh, Jesus basically said, John, you'll live a long time. You know, I want him to remain alive until I come. What is that to you? What did he tell Peter was going to happen to him? You're going to die for me. Jesus told Peter that straight up. You're going to die for me. Someone's going to take you and lead you to where you do not want to go. So Peter's like probably in prison thinking, oh, gee, the Lord told me. The Lord told me I was going to die for him. But maybe there was some sense of peace. But maybe he's thinking, I didn't think it was now. I didn't think it was so fast. Wow. So here he comes to himself. I'm out of prison. What? I'm not going to be killed? Uh, I'm out? 
Okay, and uh, I've never been in prison, but I hear once you get out of prison, it's pretty cool. My friend was in for 20 years. 20 years, got saved in jail. The last five years of prison, he was he was saved. Okay, and then he does prison ministry, but it's pretty cool being out of prison and you're out for 20 years. Quite an investment too. Peter came to himself and he said, Now I am sure the Lord has sent his angel to rescue me from the hands of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many people were gathered and were praying. Wait a minute, it's the middle of the night. People are gathered at their house. They're not having to sleep over. They're praying. Two in the morning. Three in the morning. Earnestly praying in a house for God to move, for God to rescue Peter. And I love, uh, preachers have always used this verse as a, a kind of encourage us to have faith in our prayers. Because these people were praying for Peter to be released, and then when he does get released, they're like, it's unbelievable to them. We can't believe it. So he knocked at the door of the gateway, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. And remember, there's no church building here. Yet. So the church meets in homes or meeting in the temple courts and things like that. Recognizes Peter's voice in her joy. She did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, you're crazy. You're out of your mind. <laughs> You've been praying for this. You've been asking God for this. And then he does it, and you tell her, you're crazy. Get out of your mind. Isn't that us sometimes with answered prayers, though? When God does say something, we're like, whoa, I really didn't think you'd do it. I remember when we prayed for revival my my uh, year at seminary in, the, in Fort Worth. I went down here for a couple of years. Went to Fort Worth, had this friend. He ended up on the mission field. And we got every morning to pray. We also got this guy from Korea who was an on-fire dude, and the three of us would pray every morning before class, like 6 o'clock in the morning. We'd get up and we'd pray for revival on our campus at seminary because seminaries need revival too. Okay, so we're praying for awakening. We're praying for revival, praying to God to move in our hearts, and in the spring it came. Our revival broke out. So I've been Brown Woods, and people from Brownwood came and spoke, and revival broke out of the seminary. It's powerful. People confessing sin, praying, broke out and spread to the churches. It was powerful. And Chad and I were like, yeah, yeah, amazing. But that's what we've been praying for. And I saw it at A&M, so it didn't surprise me as much because I, I knew he could do it and I knew what he does. But then uh, my friend from Korea, we seen him, he just got like in the days. And Chad and I were looking at him and he's like, hey, guys, revival. And I'm like, we're like, yeah, that's what we've been praying for. And he goes, but I didn't think he'd do it. <laughs> like, yes, that's what he does. Who do you think you're praying to? Who do you think you're praying to when you pray for this person's salvation? When you're praying for our country, when you're praying for things, who do you think you're praying to? He's the God who can answer. This is what he does. He answers prayer. When you have a fervent prayer, that's from the Holy Spirit. It's, and, and if it's from the Holy Spirit, then the will of God is probably going to be accomplished. You need to trust God and believe that when, what you're praying is actually going to happen. Yeah, it would be discouraging if we don't believe. Of course it would be. But man, that's we change things. Prayer changes things. If there's something you're not happy about, pray about it. Don't forget to pray for yourself either, by the way. It's not a sin to pray for yourself. I have a list. I have a little prayer book now. I have a list of names, rows of people from this class, previous ministries, family members, lost friends. I just have all these people, and I just pray for them. Go through my little book, and if a name jumps out, I pray for them. I have a row for myself, too. I have a row for things that I need. And I pray for that, and I've seen God answer a lot of those things for myself. Okay? But why don't you pray for yourself? For things that you want God to do in your life, for things that you need. Don't forget to pray for yourself and expect Him to hear you. Now remember, wait doesn't mean no. When you pray for something, wait does not mean no. Wait means wait. God will answer your prayers, but not in, his time, not in your time and His time. So His timing is perfect and sovereign. So wait on the Lord. Wait. Wait, wait, and keep praying. And listen, be like that persistent widow. Keep coming. Keep bringing it. Keep coming to him. That's kind of the thought that's been in my head lately. Okay. You probably hear me say it multiple times, but you get tired of it. We're going to keep coming. We're going to keep coming for people at the mall. We're going to keep coming praying for Israel and for them to be saved. We're going to keep coming for our relatives to be saved. We're going to keep coming to the throne. We're going to keep coming for revival. We're going to keep coming for this class. We're going to keep coming for our church. We're going to keep coming and praying and praying and praying. We're not stopping. We're coming back. We're coming back to the throne. All right? You got a lost friend, a lost relative, someone who's straight from the Lord. Don't stop. Keep coming to the Lord. 
We're going to keep coming into, the, into his presence. We're going to keep coming in prayer. We're going to not stop praying because this is what God does. This is what he's showing us in Acts 12. It's not just a story. It's like when the church prays, God does miracles. The whole story, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is miracle after miracle after miracle. Things that only God can do. Why do we think he can't do it now? He can. He will. That's what he does. That's why the Bible was written so that we can see what he did in the past so we can cry out for him to do it now. He can save thousands of people in one day like he did in Acts. I fully expect him to one day. I fully expect him to save some of my relatives and some of somebody else's relatives and things like that that don't know the Lord. I fully expect it. Now listen, when you're praying for someone to be saved, and you're praying and you're praying, let's say you're praying for your brother or your sister or your cousin or whatever, and you're praying and praying and praying, and you waited years. I mean, you may have waited decades. Who knows? This is what I encourage you to do. Take it to the next level. This is what I mean. Don't just pray for their salvation. Pray for what's going to happen to them after they're saved. Stop praying for it. Praying for them to be an on fire evangelist. Yes, Lord, save my brother. And make him into an on fire evangelist, Lord. Make him into a preacher of your word. Make him a powerful force in the kingdom. Take it to the next level. Don't just pray for their salvation. You've been doing that for five years or ten years. Take it to the next level. Okay? Pray that when God gets a hold of them, we're just not praying for them to be saved and be a complacent Christian. We want them to be saved and be on fire for the Lord. Even maybe putting us to shame and humbling us a little bit with their zeal. I remember when a guy got saved in, in uh, my dorm room about 1 or 2 in the morning. He got saved and he was in, and actually in the dorm room next to me. He was in my dorm but in the room next to me. His tears were blowing down my back. And he came out of that room and just started shouting in the hallway. Hey, yo, God loves you. Trying to wake up all the dorm guys. God loves you. He was just so on fire. We were like trying to calm him. Hey, hey God, guys are sleeping right now. He was he just wouldn't stop. He just got saved. He just had the Holy Spirit come in him. He was on fire. That's what we want. When we pray for our friends and our relatives to be saved, whatever we're praying for, we don't want them to just be a complacent Christian. We want them to be on fire for God. We want them to be full of zeal. We want them to be passionate about the Word. Take things to the next level on the enemy. Pray big. Pray that God sends them to the mission field. Pray that he does unbelievable things through them. I'm going to keep coming. I'm going to keep praying. Okay? So they're earnestly praying for Peter. Here they are. They're praying passionately, and he shows up. Don't be surprised if the person you're praying for doesn't come knocking on your door one day. But what he does. What God does. He recognizes Peter's voice. And her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported Peter was standing at a gate. And they said to her, you're out of your mind. You're crazy. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it's his angel. What kind of theology is that? <laughs> you ever thought about that? You think, you think it? You know, my, I have an angel that sounds like me. They were the ones out of their minds. They were called somebody crazy. They were all well, a little crazy, in some ways. But they kept insisting. I mean, she kept insisting, and they kept insisting, and Peter kept knocking. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. Now it's okay to be amazed when God does things. That's what He wants to do. He wants to amaze you. With the answer to your prayers. Has he ever amazed you with one of your prayer requests and how he answered it? He's a good God. And when he gives gifts, he gives good gifts. And it's amazing. That's what he does. One of the great things about prayer, y'all, is that we get to see the amazing power of God. How he answers things is so incredible. Wow, God, I prayed for this person and they're more incredible than I ever believed. I prayed for this person to be saved and it's better than I thought. I prayed for this job, and wow, God, you really bless me. So God will do things that amaze you, and that's okay to be amazed. But motioning with his hand for them to be silent. We have a little hand signal when we quiet it at school. I had some little hand signal where they... So um, he had a hand motion for them to be silent, and he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Now, I always thought that they brought him into the house. It doesn't look like they brought him into the house. It looks like he was standing in the entryway telling them the story. You know, probably quietly, because it's the middle of the night. And, and then he takes off. How the Lord brought him out of the prison, he says, Tell these things to James. Who's James here? Well, it's James, the brother of Jesus, who has risen to prominence in the church in Jerusalem and become one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. Okay, not, not the apostle James, he just got killed. In verse 2, this is James, the brother of the Lord. Actually, the name is Jacob. So go tell Jacob. 
and the brothers. Then he departed and went to another place. We don't know where Peter went. He went in hiding somewhere. Okay. Verse 18. Now when the day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had become of Peter. That's a little Greek phrase they have for no little. You see that a lot in the Bible. It's kind of funny. It was a big disturbance. There was no little disturbance. And after Herod searched for him, they looked everywhere for this guy. Looked in the bathroom. Looked in, I mean, they looked every nook and cranny. There. Where did he go? They made careful search for him. I didn't find him. He examined the sentries, brought the soldiers out. Hey, he was chained to you. What? You were at the door. What? Did you see anything? God took his angel and walked right by these guys. And they were awake. They weren't sleeping. I'll tell you that. They weren't sleeping. There's somebody, somebody, uh, the penalty here, and they're going to get it for losing a prisoner, is death penalty. They were right past awake people. Never saw them. Never saw them. God just made them invisible. He just blinded their eyes. Herod searched for him, didn't find him, examined the sentries, ordered that they should be put to death. So here's the great, one of the great murdering Herods, murdering more innocent people. These guys are innocent. They did nothing wrong. They get murdered by Herod. And then he went from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. So Herod gets out of town. After he murders these guys, he leaves. Why? Well, he had been kind of, had the ball rolling with the Jews, right? He had them on his side. Laid some violent hands on the church. They, the Jews kind of like him. They're all there for the Passover, by the way. Thousands and thousands of Jews from all over the world there for the Passover. They're like, oh yeah, we're getting these Christians. We're getting these pretenders. Okay. Killed James. Yeah, the Jews are loving it. Rested Peter. Yeah, let's get him too. This is me a good Passover. We're going to kill these guys. We're going to kill Peter, the leader. And all of a sudden, Peter's gone. What does Herod look like to the Jews? What is he going to say when these Jewish high priests and stuff come to him and go, uh, where's Peter? Lost him. So Herod just gets out of town. He doesn't want to be shamed in front of the Jews. So he just leaves. Okay. Slithered out of there. Went down to Caesarea and spent some time there. And if you read the rest of chapter 12, he's only got a few more days to live. God's going to strike him dead pretty soon. So, applications. Oh, okay. Nothing's impossible with God. Pray big. Keep praying for your lost friends. Keep praying for your lost relatives. God can do amazing things. If you know anything about college football, there's a football team that's been good for a long time named Alabama. They have a coach named Nick Saban, one of the top coaches in the history of the sport. Well, they got a good basketball team now. I got a good coach. Sports are about coaching, by the way. Teaching, teaching is all about teachers, too, by the way. Uh, Nate Oates, coach of Alabama basketball team, made it to the Final Four. Alabama didn't make it to the Final Four in football, but they made it to the Final Four in basketball. Wow. They're not a basketball school. They're a football school. But they got a good coach now. His name's Nate Oates. Twelve years earlier, he was a high school math teacher. Twelve years ago. Selling hot Cheetos and Pop-Tarts and Capri Suns to his students to support his basketball program. Twelve years yeah. ago, he was selling hot Cheetos, y'all, you know, <laughs> in a high school classroom teaching math. And he coached his basketball team and was trying to raise money for his program. Twelve years later, he's in the Final Four. Hey, if God could take Nate Oates from a high school math teacher selling hot Cheetos to his kids every day, to his high school students, and put him in the Final Four, it's like the pinnacle of, the, of his profession. For something as meaningless as a game? What could God do with us? What could God do with his children? We're not into self-exaltation, no, but don't limit how God can use you. When awakening comes, when revival comes, when God gets a hold of your life, you may not even be living in Houston. You may be preaching halfway on the other side of the world, leading hundreds of people in Christ. You don't know. Don't limit how God can use you. You know, when I was in high school, I could go whole days and not speak. So I know what it's like to go from being a shy person to be a bold person. I go a whole day in my freshman year and never say a word to anybody, and it wouldn't bother me. Probably bother my mom a little bit. But did you speak to anybody today? No. Never said a word all day long. When I got my golf team, it was a little bit different. But. So I know what it means to be shy. And in my senior year, uh, the youth minister said, hey, we need you to preach a little five-minute sermon for us. And I stood up there to talk. Something came out of me. And the Holy Spirit. Spoke to me. I never experienced anything like that before. I hated public speaking. I was terrified of public speaking. But God takes us and He makes us bold. He gives us courage. He He does amazing things with us. 
He uses noble vessels for his honor. He can repair any relationship. He can save any person. He can empower a shy person to be a bold witness. And he can release anyone from a spiritual prison. Father, I pray that these lessons of this story would burn in our hearts, God. I thank you, first of all, that we're not persecuted like they were in Acts, God. I thank you for that, Lord. Um, we just want to thank you. So that I can go to the mall, share the gospel, even go to Discovery Green and preach the gospel or whatever, and nobody's going to throw me in jail. Thank you for the freedom we have here, God. Please, God. Whatever the apostles had, and we know it's your Holy Spirit, and we know it's you, Jesus. Give it to us, Lord. Give us that power. Give us that boldness. Give us that courage. Give us that holiness that leads to righteousness, God. Holiness that leads to boldness, God. Give us that holiness, Father God, that we need to be a pure vessel for your honor. You can take some Cheeto-selling math teacher and put him in the Final Four. You can do anything with anybody, God. Anything with anybody. We're asking, Lord, for boldness. We're asking for words. God. We're asking for open doors in our life. We're asking that you help us not worry about all these things that don't matter or be discouraged about all these things that don't matter. Oh God, there are, there are millions of people in this country going to hell. And they are going to be suffering intensely forever. And Father, you commanded us to go and share with them good news. And you said the fields are ready for harvest, just like in Acts. Nothing's changed. But God, we need whatever the apostles said. We need that apostolic power, that anointing, that Holy Spirit, God. We need you to fill us, empower us, embolden us, make us holy, make us pure. Because we can't keep giving into sin and be powerful and bold at the same time. We've got to choose one or the other. What do you want? We want holiness, God. Help us to overcome our pride, our worries, our anxieties, God. Help us to be empowered by your spirit. Help us to be focused on the main thing. Help us make the main thing the main thing, Lord. Because all that really matters at the end of the day is who's going to heaven or who's going to hell. That's all that matters. So thank you for this class. Thank you for their heart. Thank you for their passions, God. And sometimes we just get distracted. Easy to do by the world, by the news. So, and by work or whatever we got to get done. So, Lord, we're asking and we're praying, God, that you give us a single-minded focus. So you make us pray earnestly, just like the early church prayed. And we may not be praying for Peter to get out of prison, but we got friends and relatives who are in a spiritual prison. We're lost, God. And you can get them out by your power. Just like Sarah said, even through dreams or visions or however you want to do it, God, we're just asking you to move. We're asking you to touch people's hearts, God. We're asking you to bring revival to our nation. Get our country out of debt. Get us out of spiritual debt, too, God. And, Lord, just move in our hearts, move in our lives. Send awakening, Lord. God. You know, it's got to start in us. It will start in us. That's how it always starts. So, God, anything in our life that's displeasing to you, any attitude, any words we use, anything about us, Lord, you find displeasing, please reveal that to us, Lord. And help us to be humble enough to receive your correction, Lord, so that we can be holy so that we can do your will, so we can be a noble vessel for your honor, Lord, so that we can be bold, Lord God. Oh, Lord, I just keep thinking, if the apostles were put in our generation, what would they do? Well, they're not going to be, but we are. And we are weak, we are sinful, <laughs> we are not like them. But God, you can make us like them. Because Acts is not the Acts of the Apostles, it's the Acts of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, you're alive, you're here, you're real. We can talk to you, and you can do the things that you did in the gospel that enacts Jesus. We know you can, and we just want to see you do it, Lord. We want to see you move. We want to see your kingdom come and your will be done. So thank you for letting us be alive in this time. It's not about us having a house or apartment or a good job. It's not about all that. It's about the purpose that you have for us. So let us bring you glory by accomplishing the work you gave us to do. Bless us, Friday night, if you do them all. Send out more workers into the harvest field. Go before us. Prepare us. Prepare them, Lord God. Help us to do every day what your will is. Give us opportunities to share you all the time, Lord God. Help us to be on mission. Don't let us be distracted by other things. Any idols in our life, whether it's food or sports or anything, God, phones, anything that distracts us, God, just remove it. Give us a passion for you, a passion to, to know you, worship you, be with you, Jesus out of the overflow of our relationship with you, 
we will be full. We will do your will. We will love people. I love what I heard Wednesday night, Father, about loving people first. First love when we approach someone. God, help me always do that. Love first. Forgive when we don't. Or we are so sinful. We are more sinful than we know. So, Father, please reveal our sin to us. But thank you that we're under your blood. Thank you that we're covered with your grace. So please give us repentance, Lord. Give us repentance in any year of our life, any thought, any attitude that doesn't honor you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for how the apostles lived for you and suffered in the midst of persecution. Thank you for showing us your, your power. Thank you for giving us your word. It's real. It's true. It's so amazing. I thank you for this class. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you for each one of them, Lord. Thank you for their hearts for you. Thank you for their desire for you, God. Even the ones who aren't in this room. God, they're really special to people, Lord. They really love you and they really want to serve you. So help us. Help us to grow in that, Lord. It's not about us. It's about your work and your mighty power and your name. So show us your name today. Lord. Show us your power today. Give us ears to hear what you're going to say to us in the worship service, Lord. Thanks, ears to hear, Lord God. Thanks for listening. If this week's message helped you, feel free to share it with a friend. At Common Grounds, we are striving to help people grow in their faith and build community by finding common ground in Christ Jesus. Until next time, hope you all have a great week.